subscription economy before and a, and a few hands went up. I think it's such a really interesting and important subject and topic and a trend in where business is going. So I was so glad to have uh, my friend Dennis Pomerant. He's one of the leading analysts in the CRM industry space in the software as a service space. Do we even still call it that? Is it cloud computing now? Huh? Whatever you want to call it. He's one of the best. And uh, Zora, Zora is a company. How many of you have heard of Zora? Very cool. They are, the, probably, I think, the leading company, billing and subscription management company. They are really leading the charge from a vendor perspective when it comes to this thing called the uh, subscription economy. So Brian Bell is their chief marketing officer, and he is here along with Dennis. And we're going to talk about what does the subscription economy mean and why is it good for your business and why is it good for your customers. So, okay, so in conclusion, <laughs> my, my short presentation. What I, what I did want to show you is a bell curve uh, because uh, the bell curve kind of represents everything I know about uh, uh, market life cycles and it's really germane and relevant to social business. I think uh, the subscription world came along at a very interesting time for, uh, for us and so did, and so did uh, social media and in a lot of ways I think they go together. Uh, when, we, when I think about social business, I, I don't think about social media per se, I think about social media, I think about mobile technology, I think about uh, analytics and yes, subscriptions. And the, the point of, of using a bell curve, if you can imagine a bell curve, and if you've been, read any of uh, Jeffrey Moore's work, you, you're familiar with the idea of the early adopters and the, the early majority, the late majority, and, and finally the late adopters. And in, in that kind of scenario, you, you have a situation where the earliest adopters are, are paying tens of millions of dollars, in, in many cases, for new technologies. And they're spending that kind of money because they, they want to develop something that will give them a competitive advantage. And by and large, uh, when they su succeed, excuse me, <clears throat> by and large, when they succeed, they recoup that investment. And the same thing is true for the early majority. The early majority buys uh, new technology for very similar reasons. They, they expect it to be a little more productized and packaged up and, and ready to go. In each of those, there, there is such a great profit margin that companies don't tend to have to worry about uh, how they're going to pay. As a matter of fact, a great solution when you have uh, an issue uh, dealing with customers, whether it's in sales or it's in marketing or, or in customer service, uh, when you're a new company and you're generating a lot of cash, is simply to throw a lot of uh, bodies at the problem. Uh, when you cross the midpoint, you get to a situation where uh, later majority buyers are buying because they have to. They, they're buying something to, to keep up with the Joneses. They're buying... Uh, New technology, not so much to make profits, although they would certainly like to do that. But in many cases, they're buying simply to uh, avoid costs because they've discovered that their competition using the new technology is, is uh, outperforming them uh, from a financial perspective. And they want to get back on the curve, so they, they invest in new technology. Now, right around this time in the technology marketplace that I've been observing for the last uh, 13 years or so, uh, right around that time, in, in a lot of different uh, life cycles, we began to see the emergence of social technology, which was a real boon because at the same time, we began to see the emergence of subscriptions. And subscriptions are nothing if they're not the ultimate commoditizing approach to delivering a product or a service, or turning a product into a service and delivering it to the marketplace, whether that's across the internet or it's through uh, uh, UPS and, and uh, Federal Express. But the thing about subscriptions is that unlike the early days in a market life cycle, when you could, I don't have to stand here. <laughs> I'm not using that microphone. <laughs> okay, so the, the really great thing about subscriptions is that, is that they enable you to go down the price curve pretty fast. The downside oh, the is that down. unlike the earlier days, you can't throw people at the problem. Uh, in the early days, you might have had uh, hundreds or thousands of customers. Today, if you're selling across the internet, if you're selling subscriptions, you're selling potentially to millions of customers, and you can't possibly 
hire enough people to deal with your customers. You have to become operationally proficient, which means you have to be able to capture data. You, social techniques. Capture data, analyze it, develop KPIs. We talked about that at breakfast. And, and use the KPIs to manage the business. Now, historically, when we talk about, about social media, we talk about Twitter and Facebook and, and gathering data from the, the, the personal interaction. But you know what? Your financial system in a, in a subscription business generates a heck of a lot of data about your customers that you can turn into valuable information to run your business. I'm here today to tell you that much and to introduce Brian Bell, the Chief Marketing Officer of Zora, who's going to talk to us about three really key uh, metrics or KPIs that Zora has discovered uh, can tell you a great deal about how well you're doing in your business and how well your business is going to do. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Brian. I don't know what time it is according to the agenda. If we have a few moments at the end, we'll be happy to take questions. But Brian, come on up. All right, thank you. Thanks a lot, Dennis. Thank Which you. Which one are you going to you I'm going to, I think I'm mic'd. Is this mic on? Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Good. OK, so you're going to pull up the slides. Thanks for the introduction, Dennis. Um, you know, we, we as, as both Brent and Dennis um, said in their introductions, we, we refer to at Zora this, this term, the subscription economy which is really about recurring, recurring businesses and how do you run recurring businesses, thank you. Um, but we often uh, refer to it within Zora as the relationship economy because essentially if you run a recurring subscription business, you're focused on acquiring and monetizing and growing customer relationships. And that's fundamentally different than this old world of the product economy where you're focused on selling units. Right? In the product economy, you're selling units, and in this recurring subscription economy, you're acquiring customers and you're monetizing uh, that, that customer throughout its life cycle. So I want to talk a little bit about that, and then, as Dennis said, I was going to touch on um, the, the differences and how do you actually succeed in growing a subscription business, and, and specifically get into these three metrics that Dennis mentioned at the beginning. So just by way of introduction, um, let, let, me, let me take a minute and talk about Zora. Um, uh, Zora was really, uh, well, is, is first of all a, a cloud uh, provider for, uh, for companies that are in the subscription economy. So we provide a solution that helps companies launch, grow, and manage subscription businesses. And we do that by delivering a SaaS solution that we call Z Business, which is comprised of subscription commerce, subscription billing, and subscription finance. Um, and we're very much, um, it's kind of your, your, your sort of typical Silicon Valley startup. Teen Zo, the CEO, was employee number 11 at Salesforce. And in the early days at Salesforce, um, you know, they were really sort of redefining what it means to be a subscription business. And everything they did had to be built in-house because there were no systems to run these businesses. So Teen and Mark and others in that early team, basically in Excel, we're tracking you know, customers as they came in, how many licenses did they have, what were they paying them. They were looking at when the renewal would come up, did they upgrade, you know, and then actually using Excel to track the data for billing and then integrating that into the back end system. Um, and it was that idea, the, the fact that they had to build that to run the business that inspired Teen when he left just about five years ago to start uh, Zorb. So he teamed up with some other leaders from that sort of early phase of the cloud, from PayPal and WebEx, and, and founded Zora with the, with the sole intention of helping subscription businesses launch and grow their businesses. We're, we're based um, in, in uh, Redwood City, California. We actually, uh, I, I went to our Atlanta office yesterday. We are, our second largest North America office is in Atlanta. So we're, we're actively recruiting. In fact, Georgia Tech's a big recruiting pool for us for our services and, and pre-sales. Um, so pretty excited to actually be here, uh, not only for this conference, but just to see our, our relatively new office. Um, and, uh, and we're growing uh, pretty quickly, and we have about 250 employees worldwide. So let me, let me talk a little bit more about this subscription economy. Um, again, as I mentioned, it really is this massive shift that we see in the market as you move from uh, a unit, sort of you know, one-time transaction, product-based economy, to this service-oriented, recurring 
relationship-driven economic model. And, and you see this uh, across the board. Um, you see it across all verticals and all, all, all parts of the economy. I mean, when, when the company started five years ago, we didn't anticipate that you would be able to subscribe to virtually anything as a consumer. Um, you know, we didn't, we didn't imagine that while you could subscribe to Netflix and get DVDs, that you would never really, as a consumer, own music anymore. You would, you, it's seldom that you would own movies or even that you would own cars. We're seeing this massive shift in the automotive industry right now with Avis. How many of you heard that Avis just bought Zipcar um, about three or four weeks ago? And it fundamentally is transforming their industry. In fact, in San Francisco, where I live, 35% of everyone in their 20s subscribe to a, a car sharing service. And, and it's somewhat generational, but it's really impacting the entire industry. Um, so you see it in the consumers. You certainly see it in tech. I talked about sort of the origins of Zora being with Salesforce um, and, and that connection. But you see it in all aspects of, of technology. You know, many of our customers, you know, companies like uh, Box and Splunk, Zendesk, Marketo, you know, were, were designed around the subscription business model. And so they knew that before they launched, they actually needed a platform to run their business. But what's more interesting to us is how it's impacting a lot of the legacy technology companies. So Dell, HP, Informatica, other customers that are really enterprise customers um, are, are really adopting this almost out of necessity. They're having to pivot and to essentially embrace cloud computing and SaaS because their legacy businesses are in decline and they're finding they don't have the systems in place to manage it. Media, media is another really, really interesting industry that is under uh, a lot of pressure and it's rapidly transforming. Um, you know, what's interesting about this industry is that uh, you used to outsource your relationship to the customer. In media, you would outsource circulation, and the circulation department or the, or the third party would go and, and get people to subscribe to print media. That was their function. And then, then the, the media companies would take that demographic information and sell it to advertisers, and that's how they made their money. And now they're finding that they can't survive that way, that as everything's moved online and as, as people expect uh, more from the media industry, they have to own that relationship with the customer. And so we have big companies like News Corp that have rolled out uh, Zora to essentially reestablish and, and directly build a relationship with the customer and manage um, that subscription all the way through commerce and billing um, and add value added services on top of it. And then you know, you're seeing this in other industries. Telco is another great example. You see it in other parts of automotive. We're working with a lot of car manufacturers who are starting to offer new subscription services in their cars. You'll see those roll out very soon, where you can subscribe to a whole bunch of things through your car. Uh, but you also see this because you, you see a lot of acquisitions, where legacy vendors, I mentioned uh, Avis, but you see it in, in all parts of technology, where they're just buying these new SaaS recurring models. So, so bottom line is, if, you're in, if you run a business uh, like, like Zora, we, we subscribe to virtually everything um, to run the business, right? You, you can subscribe to help desks and CRM solutions. You can subscribe to accounting solutions. You can subscribe to real estate, virtual office space, telephone systems. This is a massive shift in the way you build and grow any business. And then on the consumer side, I mean, you can subscribe to, to clothing, to wine, to prophylactics, to, uh, to razors. Dollar Shave Club uh, is an amazing customer and company that, that provides a really uh, sort of disruptive model to the established uh, shaving industry. Uh, so really, some fascinating industries out there. So why? Why is this happening? Well, I think many of you get this. I mean, it's happening because customers demand it. They like the flexibility. They like uh, the ability to be current in technology and current in media, a and it's a great business model. So if you run a subscription business, you have very different financials, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, that makes it very attractive. And this is why the valuations of these companies on Wall Street and, and by the VCs on Sand Hill Road is so high, because they look at the finances of a recurring model very different. So, so let me shift a little bit into, um, into why this is so different from a product economy. 
So in a product economy, I mentioned this at the beginning, you're selling units. You, know, you look back and you say, well, how many, how many number of widgets did I sell? How many bottles of Coke did I sell? How many iPhones did I sell? And that's how you, you measure your success. Where in a subscription economy, you're focused on the relationship. How many customers did I acquire? You know, if you look at demand gen, how many customers came in? How many converted? How many did I acquire? How many have I retained? Um, instead of pricing per unit, it's all about service plans. So do we have uh, bundled plans? Do we have a gold, uh, you know, silver, gold, and platinum edition? Do we have plans that are monthly or weekly or daily? Are they based on usage or based on user? How are we going to price the plans? Um, they're not one-time orders. It's a recurring multiple orders over the lifetime of a customer. Um, you don't have to pick a customer segment. Box, how many of you use Box to share data files? Yeah, so Box was an early customer that started with us in the consumer space. Uh, and then they said, we need to go to the enterprise because the money's in the enterprise. How do we start to sell to enterprises? And, and they realized that it's B to any. In the new world, you can sell just as easily to enterprises as you can to end consumers. And this is a fundamental shift in the subscription economy. And then finally, these financial metrics. Um, you know, in, in a traditional product business, you look at an income statement. And an income statement is a backward looking financial statement that looks at how much business, how much revenue you did, and what it costs for you to deliver that business. And in the subscription economy, it's a forward looking annual recurring revenue based financial statement. I'll talk more about this, but this is a big, big shift. And, and frankly, the industry hasn't kept up with how different the financial model is. So the bottom line is there's a big gap. There's this old world and there's a new world. And, and a lot of the, the, uh, you in this, in this new economy and others are coming to us and saying, you know, if you're, if you're the GM or the CEO or the head of sales, you're saying, how do I grow a subscription business? If you're in operations, you're saying, well, how do I manage this? Because this gets very complicated as I look at orders coming in and dynamically changing. How do I manage that all the way through to my accounting system? And then um, if, you're, if you're the CFO, you're also very concerned about getting the metrics that you need so you can really keep pulse on the health of this business. So I'm going to dig into each of these things, grow, flow, and know briefly. And then I'll, I'll talk in the context of that about these, these key metrics that are so important. So if you think about a product business, how do you grow? In a product business, you know, Apple will design the next cool iPhone. Um, they'll innovate, build the distribution channel, get it out to market, and then they have their reps and partners selling that uh, device. And then they start all over again. They create the next version of that device. Well, in a, in a, in a, the way you grow in a subscription business is, as I mentioned before, you acquire the relationship. You reduce the churns. You want to stop people from leaving. And you need to understand why they're leaving if they leave, and how do you prevent them from leaving. And you need to increase the value. These are the three ways that you grow a recurring business. Acquire customers, grow the dollar per customer, or increase the, the, or, or reduce the, the churn of that customer base. And there's a variety of strategies to do this. We, we've identified 12 different strategies that are supported in, what we, in our platform that allow you to do this. So if you're trying to acquire customers, you're launching new products. You might be uh, having, delivering products or offerings in multiple currencies. You might want to enter a new market. You, know, you, you reduce uh, churn by looking at maybe having different pricing plans. You, know, you might find that your churn is a result of only having a monthly plan when actually people want a weekly plan. Or, or you might find um, that you can, you can increase the value by charging overages on consumption or upsells or bundles. There's a variety of pricing and packaging strategies to really drive growth in this recurring model. The second area is, is process flows and, and, and uh, automating these process flows. This is very, very different than the economy that was product-based. And let me, let me just add a little more color. In a product-based business, you book an order, you ship it, right? You invoice and collect for it, and then you receive it. This is pretty straightforward, right? We, we pretty much know how this works. But in a recurring model, it's much more dynamic. And when you look at a process like quote to cash, it gets much more complicated when you start to look at renewals, right? If someone goes in and renews the system, how do you actually manage that process? What is it, how does it change your, uh, your processes? If you look at payment failures, if someone is a subscriber, and then they, their credit card doesn't go through, what do you do? 
Do you, do, you, do you suspend them? Can you stop them? Is it more expensive for you to turn off the service to them than it is to actually um, you know, keep them on the service even if they're not paying? And we've all, we, as consumers, we all see it value, we see, we see this happening all the time. We'll, we'll, we'll stop su subscribing to something and we'll continue to get the service. Often the reason is because either they don't know or two, they don't know how to cost efficiently or effectively uh, turn off or modify the subscribers, subscriptions that you have. So it's much more complicated. And, and essentially, in, in this new world, you can have multiple orders coming in that you want to have in one invoice. You might have one order coming in that you might want to invoice, uh, you might want to uh, spread out across multiple invoices. You might have an order coming in that then is going to be recognized in your accounting system in a very different way. Do you recognize revenue on a usage basis? Do you recognize it on a payment basis? What is the, what is the, the, the accounting policy you're going to use to recognize revenue? And what complexity does that have when your users are constantly changing the, the things they subscribe to? How does that impact your financial system? It gets very, very complicated. And then finally, no. What do you need to know to run a subscription business? And here's where I'm going to talk about these three metrics that, that Dennis mentioned. In a traditional income statement, we, we've all remember this from our basic accounting 101, you know, it's pretty straightforward. You say, I did $100 of revenue last year. Uh, it cost me $30. The cost of goods of the things I sold was $30. So my gross profit is $70. And, and then I have a bunch of other expenses just in my company, right? I have sales and marketing, I have GNA, I have R and D, and the bottom line is that that's my total opex. I subtract that from my gross profit, and that's your net income, right? This is how we run accounting in the business world today, but it's very different in a recurring revenue model. And the the fundamental difference is that in a recurring revenue model, you're beginning your fiscal year with a book of business. You're beginning with let's say $100 of annual recurring revenue. Whereas in a product business, you have to go out and sell all the new business you're going to generate. And so you know, we're proposing in the industry that you look at what we call a subscription economy income statement, a recurring income statement. And this is, this is different. So it starts with your annual recurring revenue. You have $100 of annual recurring revenue. You say, well, what was the churn? Well, I, I lost, let's say, 10, 10 customers. They were paying me a dollar. So I, I lost $10. So I'm down to 90 $90, right, after my churn. And then I look at the expense that, it, that I incur to run, let me build this out, to run that business. And that would be your cost of goods, but also your R&D, your data center costs, anything involved in delivering the service that you're providing. And that delivers a number that we call the recurring profit. That's your recurring profit margin. And then finally, you can take that $40. So you had $100. You lost $10 by churn. You have a bunch of expense that's needed to run the business. So you're left with $40 of profit. The big question in a recurring business is, what do you do with the $40? Do you invest it and try to acquire new customers? Or do you just you know, bring it to the bottom line? And, and this is where you'll see many businesses in this room, I'm sure, where you look at Salesforce or our own business, we're putting all of that back. Because we believe there's market opportunity out there. And we're going to spend that money to acquire new customers um, and then, and in this case, in this example, you, you took the $40, you put into growth, you have now net new ARR of $40, so you're ending with $130 of annual recurring revenue, right? This is how recurring revenue businesses run their business. This is how at Zora, we, we run our business. When we sit down with our VCs on the board, this is all we talk about. We never talk about a traditional income statement because it's not how these companies are valued. Um, so these are the three metrics that matter. Retention rate, how much of your ARR are you, are you keeping every year? Recurring profit margin, it's your annual recurring revenue, less churn, minus the cost to, to run and deliver that service. And then growth efficiency, how much does it cost you to acquire a new dollar business? How much does it cost you to acquire a new, a new dollar business? So these are the three key metrics of the subscription economy. So let me, let me just sort of transition here briefly and then, and then wrap up. So you know, the, the key issue here is that the systems in place today weren't designed to run this. To typically, a lot of product companies run their business on an ERP solution that was built for the product economy. What, what Zora provides is a system that, that helps you uh, survive in this subscription economy. We do that through these three capabilities I talked about, the ability to have subscription recurring 
uh, information in your Salesforce or other CRM solution so that you can effectively, through multi-channels, sell subscription uh, your subscription offering. The ability to bill that service, and then finally, the ability to manage the accounting close and, and run essentially a recurring revenue subledger that integrates in with your finance systems. That's what we provide, and we integrate into, into the two systems.